Welcome back to another episode of Rock Boys Football Deal. What a Saturday night. Marcel Reed, the Texas A&M Aggies, get it done in College Station. Dill, shout out to Marcel Reed, and this is a conversation that we have a lot. The quarterback it factor. It, like it's hard to it's hard to put in words. You kind of know it when you see it. I think Marcel Reed has it. I mean, you talk about a redshirt freshman that gets thrusted into the biggest environment in his life and just ice in his veins. Texas AM, I think, has finally found their starting quarterback. But I think most importantly, Dill. They found their identity. You talk about a Mike Elko win, 245 rushing yards to 33. We talked about, has LSU seen a team that's going to stick to the run like Texas A&M? I didn't think they had. You didn't think they had. I think we kind of saw it. Like how Mike Elko wants to build this program through the trenches. That's how Texas A&M won this football game. Fired up to get into, I think, some of the biggest takeaways we saw. Now, before we get into it, as always, to the Texas A&M fans, let it fly in the comment section. One, the amount of support that the Texas A&M fans have shown the boys going back to the day that Mike Elko was hired. Dill, it's been a blast covering this program, talking about the additions in the transfer portal, talking about what he's doing on the recruiting trail. We can't thank you guys enough. If you all do enjoy the content, consider subscribing to the channel. Dill, I will give you the T-box here. I think we got to start with Marcel Reed and this Texas A&M offense. What do we see out there? Yeah, and I can't imagine there's going to be much of a conversation going forward. And I just think you look that the tough part is, is Wigman in the big games has just not played very good football. You look at the Notre Dame game, you look at the first half today. I mean, those aren't good football games. They're a little bit deer in the headlights and he's just not making plays for them. And when Marcel Reed came in, again, you just see how that running game opens up. LSU couldn't attack the backsides. That's something they really like to do because, again, they can't probably go man-to-man with a in the trenches right now. a ms offensive line, I think, is too good, but they do a good job athletically getting on the backside and making plays from there. And you just see when Marcel reads in, everybody slows down a little bit, and then a and could really get to work just kind of physically abusing LSU. You, you said it, and we'll probably talk about it more as the week goes on. I think the biggest factor here is it kind of what you said about Connor Wigman. When we see Connor Wigman settled in as a quarterback, we all know what he can do. Like we saw it against Missouri. That being said, you talk about sometimes the moment feeling really big for Connor Wigman. I think you've seen that again against Notre Dame. I think you saw it again in the first half. You don't feel that way about Marcel Reed. Now, now does Marcel Reed sometimes make redshirt freshman mistakes have we seen him do that over the last couple of games that he started yeah absolutely but the one thing you can kind of hang your hat on is the moment's not going to be too big for this kid and again I think he's only going to get better as you continue to give him more work I think the second storyline this is something that we talked about when we kind of made the argument that Marcel Reed should be the full-time starter a couple of weeks ago was how does Texas a and want to run this offense like heading into this game, they ran the football 62% of the time. That's 12th most in the country. Mike Elko said it in the mid game uh, interview Marcel Reed's threat to run the football, his dynamic dual threat ability allows Texas AM to run the football more effectively. We certainly saw that in the second half of this football game. The recipe, if Texas AM goes out and competes for an SEC title, becomes a college football playoff team, what is it going to look like? It's going to be running the football and playing elite defense. That's what you saw tonight against LSU, and that's how Texas A&M is going to win an SEC championship and make it to the college football playoffs. What quarterback gives you that ability more? I think it's becoming pretty clear that Marcel reads that guy. Yeah, it really is. And, again, I can't imagine, like, you look, just how different it felt in that first, second half. Like, I just don't think you can go away from him. I think the keys have happened. And, you, again, you even look out into the future. Like, he's going to be there for a couple of years. I think you have a really good building block to kind of do, again, what you kind of said Mike Elk wants to do. So I you can't imagine this battle goes on much more. And, and even him as a thrower. Like, again, have you seen some of that, like the progression stuff that you want to see him get better at? Yeah, absolutely. Guess what? The only way you get better at that stuff is playing football. He's 2-2 two two for 70 yards. Beautiful, deeper third shot to Noah Thomas. The arm talent's there for, for Marcel Reed, too. Again, there's more polish that needs to be had. We all know he can sling the football. Though the offensive line continues to be a storyline. 
they are getting – and, again, Colin Klein's going to throw a lot of different rushing concepts, especially when you have Marcel Reed. It allows you to get so creative in terms of how you want to run the football. I can't tell you how impressed I am with – this was the biggest question mark for Texas A&M heading into the season, at least from, from my standpoint. They've dealt with a couple of really tough injuries on the offensive line. They continue to be such a solid unit, especially when it comes to blocking in the run game. Mike Elko, Adam Cushing, whatever, Tommy Moffitt is a strength and conditioning coach, whatever it is, probably a mix of all of them. That that's If there's one thing to really take away in terms of the future being Brighton College Station, it's this one-year turnaround that we've seen from this offensive line unit. And I also think you look at what they're good at and what it kind of makes sense. Like their pass pro hasn't been incredible. I don't think you saw Notre Dame get after him. You certainly saw LSU getting after him a little bit in the first half. And that is probably another thing when you talk about why it makes sense to probably just use Marcel Reed, be the guy, if you will. I think he can really lean into what they do good because one thing is they're physically more ready to play. That's probably what you most notice. They move guys off the ball. They're athletic in space. They can pick guys up at the second level. Again, like they're not great in pass where you still see some breakdowns and some communication issues for sure. But in the run game, they're really, really tough. So, again, that's probably where you want to get them rolling. And when they started running the ball more, I thought that unit started to just play simply better football. So yeah, I They gained their play. confidence. One, sorry to cut you off, but 100% agree. Like The best way to give an offensive line confidence, let them move some bodies off the line of scrimmage. As they leaned into the run game, when Marcel Reed came in, you saw this offensive line get a little bit of a different attitude. I think you mentioned something like, one, they're really good at the point of attack. Like they can move bodies off the line of scrimmage, but there's also some really big functional athletes that can climb to the second level and get to the second level. Now, I think we got to give a shout out to the backs too. Amari um, Daniels, Le'Veon Moss. You know, Le'Veon Moss early fumble. You don't see that much out of that kid. After the fumble, he was lights out. You talk about the physicality that you think of, of a Mike Elko program. Le'Veon Moss kind of gives that. Amari um, Daniels as well. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, they both just attack the line of scrimmage and get downhill. Now we're seven minutes in. We haven't talked about this Texas A&M defense. And Dill, I, I don't even think Texas A&M played the best game on defense. Like you look at LSU eight of 17 on third downs. I was kind of surprised with the amount of third and long conversions LSU was able to make. Now, Nuss had three interceptions, a couple bad ones, the, no question about it, but he also made some really good throws. And what I was most impressed with Garrett Nussmeyer is there were some times where, look, there were a lot of muddy pockets. Like We all know how disruptive this front seven is for Texas A&M in the pass rush. Like Garrett Nussmeyer is not the athlete that Marcel Reed is. But there were a couple times where Garrett Nussmeyer was able to create a, a, a little bit outside the pocket, allow his wide receivers to find some separation downfield. There were times where Garrett Nussmeyer, he just kind of came up big in some big moments on those third down plays. And, and obviously most of the time they were getting hurt was in that first half of the football game. And again, that's probably a little bit of a combo of offense putting you a bad spot with the turnover, yep. just not playing good football. So they were on the field. It felt like for a fair amount of that yes. first half. So again, like you look when they started to play more complimentary football and they got Marcel Reed in the game and they were running the ball and they were possessing it and they were driving. Like you saw that Texas A&M defense really start to shut it down and they started to play really well. So again, it's like, you look, it's just like stylistically, and I don't mean to keep harping on it, but like stylistically, it does feel like everything makes sense for Marcel Reed to be the guy because you want to possess the ball, you want to keep that defensive line fresh, and let them, let them go tee off. And they started to get after, I thought, Nussmeyer are pretty good in the second half. So I just look, again, when they're playing their best offensive football, and that's running the ball and keeping it, their defense is really good. I I'm not really quick to get on that defense for the first half performance because, again, when your offense is playing that poorly against a really good team, it's hard to play really elite defense. Like Michigan fans over here, we know that better than anyone right now. So, again, I look, when they had their offense kind of clicking and running the way I think you want AM to be running it, their defense was playing really, really well. So uh, another key that we had in this football game, or, or one of the storylines was – LSU running the football efficiently on first and second down, staying out of those third and long situations. We got our answer. Like, Caden Durham has been cutting up defenses all year. Well, LSU, again, what, 33 rushing yards? Now, that number's including sacks, but again, 33 rushing yards, even if you're including sacks, that kind of paints the picture of thought those linebackers. 
Dill, I'll say it again. Like Scooby, I'm gonna say it until he stops playing. Like Scooby Williams is a revelation for this Texas A&M defense. Like he was legitimately not a very good football player in 2023 at Florida. Has come over to Texas A&M. He's an All SEC linebacker. We all know what Tory Newark can do. Massive interception. Even hey, Sanford, you gotta give Sanford his props. Yeah, I always. Always, and you are always reminding me of him. Like again, they got a, a stable of guys in that linebacker room that can Playing play high quality of football. Moves, they're getting, they're getting sideline to sideline, doing the things you want, and then obviously Torian York making big time, like Torian York, middle linebacker, leader of the team, kind of plays. So it's like you're Dude, really starting to get these linebackers to make it happen. And I think the last talking point is I, again the secondary on paper. What Nuss had uh, four or five, two touchdowns, three picks. Shout out BJ Mays. But also shout out to the secondary, especially in the second half. Like there weren't, I feel like a lot of the throwing windows and explosive passing plays that LSU was able to manufacture came off those Garrett Nussmeyer creating. Like there weren't a lot of ton of, for one, not a lot of breakdowns, but I think more importantly, not a ton of early separation for these LSU wide receivers, which I think was another big storyline for Texas A&M. Again, Dill, I think at the end of the day, one, a massive, like we kind of said it, like college football playoff vibes to this football game, like Texas A&M now in the driver's seat to wind up in the college football playoffs. But I think even more importantly than that, like Texas A&M tonight, I think they found their identity as a football team. And that is run the football, control the time possession, play good defense. It is that's not sexy anymore, and that's not what a lot of college programs are going to. But it works for Michigan in 2023. I think it certainly can. Like, it, Texas A&M has the roster for it to work for them in 2024. Work for I'm, the dogs in the year, in the two years it, they were leading up to the 2021-2022. Yes, so I think, like, again, it is getting back. Like, if you can play really good defense, I think you're starting to see good defenses can be a real problem in college football. When it's almost like the the pendulum switch so much to the spread attack and speed and space that the teams that reverted back to we are going to control the line of scrimmage and build the line of scrimmage up, you almost have that advantage because everyone else is recruiting the flashy five star wide receivers and like that's kind of the I don't want to change this to a Michigan podcast but like that's kind of what Michigan did like hey Ohio State you can go recruit all the flashy five star wide receivers. We're going to build along the lines of scrimmage. It's not going to be flashy in all these football games, but it kind of gives them an edge. I feel like that's kind of where we're looking at with Texas a and I'm, I'm really excited for the, the, the Mike Elko era getting off to a really good start, and we were all fired up when he got the job. Early, early results, but the early results are positive. Mike Elko, the guy in college I'm just station. Like guy, again, guys who played last year for AM are playing better. Just simply DJ DJ yeah. Hicks even making some real good plays. And he's a guy last year I was like, oh, you knew there was the talent, but you were just disappointed on almost the way he was playing. It didn't feel like he was playing physical, explosive, hard, like to deal with type kind of guy. He's playing that way. Albert Regan, I mean. He didn't play that way last year. He's playing like a real game record right now. So, again, you're just looking. Like, guys are really developing at a really high level. That's probably the most encouraging thing. And and it happened quicker than I thought. Like, I didn't think they'd be able to put this offensive line out there and be able to legitimately dominate at an SEC level. So, man, kudos to what they're doing. It certainly feels like they're off to a good start. It's not like Mike Elko can't recruit. He's putting together a really good class. So, like, everything's kind of shaping up the way I think you want it if you're a and and I'll tell you this one, this much I should say, this game means a lot on the recruiting trail. Like when yeah. you go to head-to-head with LSU a lot on the trail, you had a lot of your top prospects, not only the 2025 but 2026 class watching this football game, electric environment, dope uniforms. <laughs> That's how you went on the recruiting trail, baby. We'll close it out there. Appreciate you guys rocking with it. If you all do enjoy the content, consider subscribing to the channel. We'll talk to you all later. Peace.